This is Remo Daily, your daily dose of inspiration. On our agenda today on the world's first virtual talk show, when is it too late to follow your passion? What an honor to have an illustrator, a superstar with us today. Please welcome Yuko Shimizu. Hi, Yuko. Great to have you with us. Thank you so much. We will dive into your work today, but everybody who has ever been to your website, I mean, it is just astounding. Uh, you are pouring out art and beauty everywhere you go. Can you just share with us, how was your day like today? How, what did you create today? Oh my God, I haven't created anything today. <laughs> You know, like I, so like not to brag or anything. I was on TV like a month ago, a little bit less than a month ago. You know, like someone invited me for Asian American, you know, Pacific Islander month and wanted to do a mini segment, which was great. And I thought that was that, you know, like, oh, it's great. You know, like so happy. And then people started ordering prints for my small print shop. <laughs> And I think I got a year worth of um, order in four hours. Uh-oh. Actually, Susanna just posted in the chat. I saw that segment. It was awesome. Um, so you. congratulations on your big uh, TV exposure. And Yuko, you have a massive, um, a massive community, a massive family. But our topic today is when is it too late to start fo- to follow your passion? And to understand why we chose this topic, Yuko, it's important to know that you wanted to be an artist when you were little, but you didn't go to art school until you were 34 years old. So please take us on this journey and, and share with us what happened in the meantime in all these years, what held you back from following your passion in the first place? Yes, yeah, so um, when I was like, I don't know, three or four, uh, when I was in kindergarten in Japan, um, you know, like we're talking about like, early 1970s, late 1960s, Japan, right? Uh, So like, it might sound a little bit off, but bear with me. Um, The kindergarten teacher asked us what we wanted to be when we grow up. And most of my classmate girls said, we wanted to be, I wanted to be, I want to be a pretty bride. You know, like, I know it's like kind of like 21st century sense. It's like horrifying, but like, you know, like, that was how girls were told. And unfortunately, in some sense still is in Japan and many parts of the world. And, but I remember my earliest memory was that question and the answer. And my answer was, I want to be a painter. And my answer in my mind that I didn't say was like, girls, Bride is not an occupation. <laughs> so like I was a little weird exactly. Japanese girl growing up. I, I don't know, like my, my mom was a stay home mom. So I don't know where that came from. But yes, I did not pursue art because, you know, like I teach art school kids and I think it's great when young students, 18, 19, 20, know exactly what they want to do because I did not. Um, Everyone said, you know, there are are people more talented than you, which is true and which is still true, but like, it's not about talent, right? It's about how much you want to do and how much effort you want to put in. (laughs) So it's like a wrong answer, but like, you know, if you are young and you're told it's a phase, you know, like there are more talented people than you. Like, you know, like don't be an artist and starve yourself, get a job. And so I went to a regular university and got a, a business degree and went into corporate PR in Tokyo. And I ended up being there for 11 years. And oh. not that I loved it, the work in, was interesting but also like mainly i was young and i really didn't want to didn't know what i wanted to do or what i should or can commit to so it's a Mm -hmm. commitment problem you know like i felt like oh yeah there are people who are better than me it's a phase it will go away it did go away for a while but then when i hit around 30 and i felt like i'm not a little kid anymore 
And do I want to be in this corporate world, which I was not fitting in so much? And then that's when I really started to seriously think. And, you know, like it sounds like looking back, it just happened automatically. But like I spent a few years thinking what's really in for me, <laughs> what I really wanted to do. And at the end, what it, you know, like my ans answer to myself was like, well, question to myself was like, what is something I haven't done? I will be like regretting at the end of the life if I didn't try it out, even if I don't succeed. And wow. that was art, you know, going back to the, the kindergarten, you know, I said I wanted to be a painter and mm -hmm. I always loved to draw and paint and I never pursued it. So I decided, okay, you know, it's as easy as it is. We only live once. So why don't I try it out? And, and then, you know, with like, I need money and planning to actually move to US and go to art school. So all in all, I started thinking around 30. By the time I started art school, I was 34. By the time I graduated art school, I was 38. That's when I started my career. Yuko, so many of us in the pandemic are reshuffling, are asking ourselves what we would really like to do. What, do, what stands out? You know, like it, so, you know, like people ask me, like, how was I able to, you know, like depart from a stable job to do something like completely unstable and unclear of the future. And one of the biggest reasons was like, at the end, I had like two terribly mentally abusive bosses and I tolerated working under them for like maybe last two years or so. And why I'm bringing this up is that, you know, the pandemic is not something anyone wanted to have. And it's, it's negative for most of us, right? And it's, it's like me having two mentally abusive bosses is not my planning. And it was like absolutely negative effect on my life. And so sometimes we can make decisions we won't make otherwise when we are facing the negative situations. You know, like we're kind of forced to choose things that we don't necessarily have courage to choose. So, you know, like pandemic is absolutely terrible and it's still terrible. And but and, and also it's so easy said than done, like, you know, turn the negative into positive. But if you can. And many people have, right? A lot of people departed their jobs to pursue new things, different things that they, you know, never thought they will have a chance to. And I think we're kind of given a chance by experiencing something so negative that like sometimes when we hit something extremely negative, we see our life, we see our vision in our life more clearly than when things are working out, because when things are working out, why leave? When mm -hmm. I have nice bosses and steady paycheck, you know, like great benefit, that's why I ended up being there for 11 years. And right. so it is an interesting time in everyone's lives. You know, like it's, it's too early to say, but, um, we will find out a few years from now, right? Because people are making a lot of changes in their lives. And it's so great to see all the shares here in the chat because a lot of you out there, and this remote daily is also an effect of this time, are trying something new, are doing something new. Uh, I think uh, we saw here David sharing, hey, he's currently drawing while listening to this uh, to this show, to this conversation, kudos to you for, you know, for being creative, for being out there, for putting yourselves out there. Because as you said, Yuko, it is an incredibly vulnerable time and it's not over yet. What you, you are teaching young artists 
every day. You're now in the room full with filled with artists that adore you, follow you. It, and you have said to us that you know you you faced rejection when you first wanted to pursue your dream. But still, when you get older, you still have these voices in your head. You just said it. There's the stable paycheck. There's the sort of I have a job identity. So what do you say to people, either young, your students, or older, midlife, who are starting out new, who who constantly have this like, I need the money and nobody needs me in that space. I'm too old. Like, what do you what is your direct response to encourage someone to pursue something new? You know, like, so um, w when, so when, when I was in school, back in school, and I was like, what, mid thirties to late thirties, and my friends are like, you know, getting promoted or like having family, buying a house, you know, like, and I'm like living with two roommates in like, you know, remote part of Brooklyn, like, you know, like commuting and then my like lunch money was like super limited and then like, you know, buying these, I don't know, like, you know, bagels for lunch every single day. Right. But so it, it's, we never get rid of this voice in our head that like, you know, like, oh, this is not going to last. This is not going to work out. Um, but the bottom line is it, you know, there is like a dreams and there is fantasy. I have fantasy. Fantasy is something I don't need to materialize. It's fantasy. But like dreams is like, I would love to do this. And it's important to do it because I think the worst regret we have in our lives is not something we have done, but things we have not done. So, you know, whenever like I wake, woke up in the middle of the night, I sometimes still do, but like, you know, when I was back in school, like, oh my God, what am I doing? And like, you know, what's my future? But then like, you know, calm down, Yuko. It's like, first of all, I wanted to go to art school. I'm in art school. Second of all, I wanted to live in New York. I'm living in New York. So I'm living my dream. And third, if this thing doesn't work out, it, it's not the only choice, right? Like I put 100% in at the art school point and not looking back, but also if this thing doesn't work out, I have skills, I have experience, I can do other things. And I think it applies to almost every one of us, but like if we try, you know, we have tried things that we wanted to accomplish that we, we put a lot of effort in that didn't work out. It doesn't have to be Korea, you know, like, or like, you know, like if you are in love with someone and like, oh, should I tell him? Should I not tell him? You told him and he said, no, I have a girlfriend, whatever. Then you kind of can't like deep we're like humans are strong enough to be able to move on from things we have put effort in and have done and have a workout but uh, i think the worst regret is the what if i have done that at that point right and, and sorry we yeah. were no, so no. Uh, thank you. And sorry for to interrupt you. We will uh, take the second half of our conversation today to look into your actual work process, which is fascinating. We'll do that in a second. I just have one more uh, question. You came from the corporate world. You have a business degree. And often art and commerce is something that people don't want to mix and don't want to talk about. But I think some artists are the best entrepreneurs ever because it's a constant struggle. And we have many here in the chat who say, I would love to live off my art. I've been trying hard. You just talked about what it meant for you to live in one of the most expensive places on earth to pursue your dream. So did you learn anything from your business degree, from living in, 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 and staying and, and working in the corporate world that helped you become what you needed to be as an artist and entrepreneur? Yes. Yeah, so like, you know, the funny thing is like, when you go to art school, like, you know, art education in general, like it's changing, but like art is sacred. And then like, you know, we don't talk about money. We don't talk about business. Right. 
But if you are in any creative field, making income from it to pay your bills, you are an entrepreneur and you are a small business. So, you know, people think artists are drawing and painting every day, all day in our studio, but we might actually, in actuality, we might only do it half a day, you know, half of the week, we are doing something else, you know, writing emails, negotiating fees, you know, like try to make connections, chasing after the money you haven't gotten paid. And to do that, you like any experience outside of art do help. And I often tell my students, like, you know, if you end up getting a day job, that you don't love, you know, you don't have to like keep doing it for a long time, but at least try and get something out of it, you know, learning experience. Interesting. So instead of being ashamed of, you know, waitressing or, or, or working at an office just to get by, it is an experience and you can draw something from it that will help you with your artistic career. Thank you for all this encouragement, uh, Yuko. We are so happy to have you and lucky that you shared some work with us coming here. Um, we're now going to look into your design process. And the example that you brought is from one of my favorite comedians, Ali Wong, who you just collaborated with. So before I share my screen, how did you end up working with this fantastic comedian? How did they approach you? So, um, yeah, it's almost like coincidence. So I no, like Phil Chan is a friend of mine and he is an art director and I met him when he used to work for big ad agency, but we never work together. We're kind of like, you know, mostly online social media friends. We talk to each other on Instagram, that kind of friend, you know, like <laughs> there, there are a lot of creative people like, you know, who can be clients, but they, you know, we, you end up never working with them. And that's that and that's fine because I would love to have friends in many different fields. So Phil called me, you know, like early this year, maybe. And she, he's like, do you know Ali Wong? And like, yeah, of course, like, I mean, who doesn't? And he said, like, she's a good friend of mine and her new Netflix show is coming up and she wants to make a merch and she want her to, you know, like be kind of like superhero ish look and then put it on t-shirts and sweatshirts so i thought you were perfect so do you want to do this and that's how it came about fantastic so you shared with us um some drafts that you created and i'm going to share my screen now and then you're going to take us into the fine print and the final result so here we go um this is just for everyone who is here with us right now this is the the inside of your mind and what came out when you first started this project project so please please take us to your initial ideas of what you created for ali so i looked at a lot of uh, old superhero comic covers like mostly like wonder woman you know like very old ones like 1940s 50s 60s to get like traditional superhero look because like she is like a little ball of fire, right? So <laughs> that's what I wanted to do. And then Ali and Phil wanted, there were three specials that she's done and mm -hmm. three different outfit and the look and hairstyle. And so can you bring all these three into the mix? So we, I initially did like two sketches, but at the end, um, we moved around elements, so it's like a mix of two separate sketches mixed together. So, like, I, I don't know, like, which you, you put in this uh, slideshow, but uh, there are, like, montage of different ones, and there are different variations in, like, wait, 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 what's different? But they were just, like, putting together different elements into uh, one. So uh, the elements we can see, uh, there is fire. Uh, there is, of cor course, um, her being pregnant on stage, which was huge. Um, and I think a first for a comedian uh, doing a Netflix special. And um, it is also 
the superpower references that you just talked about that are so visible in the sort of um, composition of, of the imagery. Um, now we are getting, I think, uh, through your ideas to the final one. I think this was it, correct? Yes, yes, this is the final one. And what happened between this and this? Oh, so um, the, when the sketch gets approval, uh, I, well, it's already on my computer, right? Because I already like initial sketches are in pencils, but uh, in color pencils, but I have to scan in to send it to the client. And mm -hmm. also, you know, when I manipulated them, you know, the files of Photoshop. So what I do is put the file and decide how big I want to draw. Uh, it is usually decided by how big it will get printed, which is the t-shirt. So like, you know, this right. size ish and also how big the face is because faces, especially likeness faces are very important. So I have to get the enough, uh, face space to get all the details things. Mm -hmm. So I think the main face was like this big and then I print out the original sketch to the size I want to draw and then cut the paper and put the sketch, printed out sketch underneath the nice paper that I'm actually ah. going to be drawing and use the white box and kind of trace it. So the composition's there and then I will start inking using a brush and black ink on the watercolor paper. Fantastic. And we can see here, uh, it is it is almost a meditative work, right? You have to be very focused, very still, because um, this is what ends up on probably hundreds of thousands of t-shirts. This is the actual material. This is the actual ink. Um, and there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of admiration here coming through in the chat for your work here. And um, what I was fascinated by was a little detail. And I think it's coming up um, now, after we see here the, the final um, the final fine draw version, I, I'm butchering the, the correct terms, I'm sure, which is the shoe. You change the shoes. Here, it's all high heels. And then we're looking at, I think, just bands. What happened here? So um, initially, I was sent the promo photo, like the poster photo, and she was wearing high heels. And then... Uh, you know, like it's a pretty long process. This is a relatively simple drawing, but it's a pretty long process. So I was listening to her audiobook, which is great. You know, if you ever want to like read the book, do the audiobook because she reads it. And it's really funny and really touching and, you know, like talks a lot about interesting things that you want to know as a creative person, but all the mm -hmm. person in general. But like she talks about, you know, like when I do stand up, I have to be comfortable. So I always wear flats. And I was like, you know, drawing these like high heel and then like, huh, she says flats, but whatever, you know, it was on the photo. And then of course, the, at the end, you know, I showed the photo and then like Phil's like, oh yeah, sorry. Yes. Like, can we change it to the shoes she actually wore during the stand up? and not the shoes for the photo shoot. So I drew these you know, bands separately later on and put together in Photoshop. So computer really helps. And uh, that's the final version. And this is it. Um, congratulations. Um, there's so much energy in this picture. And if you haven't seen or heard Ali Wong, um, I can only tell you from a from a consumer from far away, just knowing her from her specials. This is exactly what she represents to me. Thank and you. Um, uh, thank you so much for sharing this with us. We have, um, of course, the T-shirt is everywhere out there on Ali Wong's website. This made it into the world as you see it, and uh, it's just another example of your amazing work. A lot of um, appreciation here coming in through the chat. And Yuko, when someone looks at your website and then your Instagram, which hundreds of thousands of people do every day, you will absolutely have a signature style. You have something that you look at and people will say, that's that's a Yuko. How did you how did you develop this? What what is what is the the sauce that that you 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 made? That's a that's a very good question, you know, because 
I teach, so everyone who wants to be professional artists, like they're looking for styles, right? Like, you know, what is my style? How can I find my style? And I was the same when I was starting art school. Uh, but when I was starting art school, there were a few things I really hated about my art, which is I grew up in Japan watching animation and reading manga. And that's how I started drawing. And I actually haven't read any manga or watched the animation for a long time. So my last comic and anime was probably when Akira came out, which I'm sorry, I'm old, but like, you know, that's in the 80s. Uh, but it never went away because, you know, that was how I started drawing and everyone who looks at my work, especially when I was back in Japan and I wanted to go to art school and like, oh, you say you want to go to art school and be an illustrator, but like, all I see is manga from your pictures. And I hated hearing that because they, you know, that it, what implies is that they don't take me seriously because I draw like manga, but also they don't take me seriously because I draw like manga, but I don't make manga. You know, I'm not a storyteller in that sense. I can't come out with, you know, multiple page stories using my images. So I felt like I was kind of a loser. So when I came to US in art school, I wanted to learn how to draw and paint like Americans. And it's like funny, like looking back, like saying it now, but I was dead serious. And during four years in art school, what I realized is like in art school, you sure you learn how to draw and paint and teachers are there to help you. But what they all helped me was that I draw the way I draw because it's me and being influenced by manga and anime and that comes out regardless of what is also me and there's nothing wrong with that and to embrace it so you know like when we talk about style we often talk about it's something floating outside you and to grab it but it's not it's actually um inside you and you have to find it and so like i think like four years of art school felt like kind of like philosophical like i don't know like therapy sessions for four years to find out wow. and be comfortable with things i can't change because i am who i am fantastic i mean uh mic drop um and everybody can see your style right now while flipping through your website, which is a treasure trove by itself. I could spend hours just on your website flipping through. We also just saw um, the commission by our mutual friend who brought us together, Jana Meyer Roberts, uh, who just assigned you over from Europe. So you're getting your 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 work is sought after from all over the world by this point. What does success mean to you, Yuko? Is it do you have a definition for that now that you are by any measures from the outside world successful? I don't know, like, I don't like the word success. Like, you know, like it's it's kind of simplified and I don't know, I feel it's like a little bit arrogant, you know, like I'm very fortunate. I do what I love to do, which is create artwork and get paid and pay my bills and feed my dog, right, with it. But, um, I don't know, like success, like success is something like I don't feel successful. I don't know, like success is what someone tells you or someone defines you. But like not really something I define by myself. I don't know if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I mean, like if making a living doing what i love to do is the definition of success i feel it's successful but then i don't really like the word success so i don't really like the word fans like i don't know like i don't think there are fans in illustration like you know there are 
artists who like your work or like you know students who want to pursue the same career I'm pursuing and those people might be nice enough to follow me or like my work but I don't call them fans so like fans and success two words that I don't I feel very uncomfortable with Fantastic. And this room is just speaking by itself and just put it in the chat. So much love in the Zoom room for you. So much support from all the people that want to be with you, that appreciate what you do. And what is that other than a sign for what you're doing is the right thing. And you're inspiring so many others, including us today. Thank you, Yuko. Let's geek out for a moment in the end. You just shared that mangas have been a huge inspiration from you from very very early on, what, where do you go today to find inspiration? Do you have newsletters, apps, podcasts, certain artists that you follow? Please help us a little bit to go with you um, and where you land every day when you look for inspiration. So um, it might be like a little odd, but um... I feel like at this point in my career, like, you know, yeah, like I love other illustrators work. So like visual art in general, but like, I can't look too much at other artists work because I, you know, I'm a working artist myself and, you know, I don't want to be influenced by what other people do. So although I look at them, my inspiration comes from mostly reading books. Like when I have free time, I, love to read books i love to read more books i just started audiobook because of avi wall project mm -hmm. i didn't do it before and so now like you know i can draw and listen to books um in the perfect world traveling because everything is stimulus right like everything's new and fresh and something you have no experience but of course you need time and money to travel so the you know sometimes i'm lucky enough to travel if not and most of the times i'm not i'm stuck at home you know working on my drawings or you know chasing after the invoices that people haven't <laughs> paid me and the best thing i can do are the books because they take me to the world um i can't go otherwise and mm -hmm. also books are visual only in your head which makes it i think a very good workout for my brain because wow. we have to put images out but like i think i'm in the point of my career like images and inspiration should be non-visual but visual in my head so that flexes my brain and work out and get the creative muscles built in my brain so I can put more things out. So that's how I feel like I really love to read books by authors or about the topics that takes place in places I have never been, which is like really cool. Um, and it, it, I feel fortunate that I can read in English because when I was in Japan, you know, like Japanese translations of books. Yeah, there are a lot, but there is limitations. But like reading in English, basically you can read any books from any part of the world and there is someone translating them. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's really fascinating. So wow. that's how I get my inspirations. So much to unpack here. So <laughs> I love this so much. So first of all, you say, if you follow your passion, if it's if it happens to be an art and you're expressing yourself through your art, forget looking at other people and flicking through your Instagram all day, especially when you're a visual artist. Because as Lee put it in the chat just a few minutes ago, you have already a lot to do. There's the marketing, the emails, the clerical, the budgeting, the, the writing, the negotiating, the hustling. And then you have to create. And instead, there's this beautiful image that you just painted of yourself just sitting there with a book or having just your your airpod or your earbuds in and and just scribbling something and not looking at what other people do but letting your brain as you said work out letting your brain work out and create images in there that you then can put on paper maybe later maybe out of the moment 
that is how you find inspiration. And I just wanted to paraphrase that because I, I found it so amazing. We have had many musicians here on Remote Daily and some of them say, you know what? Yes, I can do this interview, but actually I speak through my instrument. So don't ask me what I'm doing. Maybe you can ask me why I'm doing it, but don't ask me for a genre or a classification. I don't know, like just listen, you know? And I feel like if people wanna know you, just watch, right? Just watch your work and, and, and take it in. That's the expression, as you just said. That's what you put out there after having processed so much. Do you want to share what's on your nightstand right now, though? Is there any book that you're reading right now that you want to share with the world? I am reading uh, Leaving Atocha Station, uh, Ben Lerner. Uh, mm. So um, I, I just came back from Spain. I taught a four-day workshop in Sevilla. And um, there was like a soccer match going on. So like I was supposed to take the train from Atocha station in Madrid to go straight to Sevilla, but I couldn't go because no hotels were available. So um, I said like, look, why don't I get a room in front of the train station and stay there and relax one night mm -hmm. and then take the train the following day. So that's what I did. So. Um, I thought it is like a right book to read. And although like I just said, like, you know, read the books about this as I haven't been, but it is an interesting book in a way that, um, you know, I always wonder about like, how would it be living in Europe? You know, like it's not my dream yet, but I contemplate mm -hmm. a lot because I lived in Japan. I don't feel like moving back there. I don't know if mm -hmm. I want to live in New York forever, though I love it. And so this book is about an American poet uh, getting a grant and living in Madrid for like, a, I think a year and then what he experiences. And so to read about someone who's actually as a foreigner living in Madrid, mm -hmm is a very interesting book to read so i'm almost done with it like that's what i'm reading right now fantastic i would like to uh, close with one uh, question from the chat from adam um yuko do you find that your location has helped you so this ties right into what we just heard what does new york mean as a place to you so new york so i i felt because i grew up a little bit in suburbs of New York. And then, then I went back, you know, it was only four years when I was in middle school. And I went back and I thought Japan was not really a place for me anymore because it is really difficult to look like a Japanese person, but don't act like a Japanese person. And so for me, New York feels home because mm -hmm. you can be you know, Felix, you're from Germany, right? Like I'm from, right. you know, like everyone's from everywhere else, regardless of from abroad or, you know, outside of the state or the city. And you can dress up or talk funny or you name it, like you're accepted and there are not many places like that. And that's why I love being here. When I moved to New York, like more than 20 years ago, it was important for a creative person to be located in New York because all your potential clients are here. But with the internet being how it is in 21st century, I don't think you need to live here in order to, you know, have a successful, successful career in creative field. You can live anywhere. You just sometimes visit and say hi to your clients and mm -hmm. you know fascinating get, yeah but otherwise you don't i just still live here because it feels home but also mm -hmm. fantasize not dream yet about maybe living in madrid because i i feel <laughs> i i love it there but, um, talking about I, what's next to you might be to meet you at atocha station then um and i just had interviewed a an investor in art who said, uh, who's also between Germany and New York, and he said, the art is made in Berlin now uh, in his world, but it's sold in New York. So he needs to be in two places. And the financial power of the city 
Uh, I think it has really changed through the pandemic, but it's still very much here. You are still very much here. We are lucky to have you here in New York. Thank you so much for taking the time, Yuko. And the last question is always, how can we as a community support you? What can we do for you? You don't, you don't have to do anything for me. You know, like be good to yourself and, <laughs> you know, be creative and have a happy life. That makes me happy. You're the best. Um, thank you so much, Yuko. This is Remote Daily. I'm Felix. Bye-bye. This has been Remote Daily. Thank <music> you.